Greetings, fellow truth seekers. Welcome to lesson five in our study through the book of Romans. I've entitled the lesson, Having the Law and Being Circumcised. Our text for this lesson is Romans 2, 6 through 2, 29. So we've done this a little bit different. Uh, what you're going to have here is really, this is just the lead, and then we're going to shift to uh, me teaching in class Sunday morning. Uh, so I pick up the video right after I pray to get us kicked off and we go right into the video lesson. So this is a little bit different than we've done before. Uh, let me know if you have a preference, but otherwise the plan will be to actually shift to putting up the recordings from uh, the class session itself. Uh, so with all that, let's go ahead and get to the lesson that occurred this past Sunday morning. Thank you. So let's just get at it by way of reminder. So last week, if you remember, we opened with why God's wrath is being revealed against all men. In particular, in context, though, Paul was talking about Gentiles. If you remember, he made the case in Romans 1 that God's eternal power and God's divine nature are clearly being displayed in the creation. That was his point. His point was that no men have an excuse because God's eternal power God's divine nature are clearly seen and have been perceived. By the way, that Greek word means to know and to understand. Men not only saw it, they understood it. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows forth his handiwork. Day unto day it's under speech. Night unto night it shows knowledge. There's no language where it's not understood. And that is Paul's point. No one is going to say, God, I didn't know. The heavens are indeed declaring his glory. And that was Paul's point. But then he got to the grander point. Why God's wrath is being revealed against all men. In particular, he's talking about Gentiles, but it's all men. Number one, the first charge. In spite of all that, men apart from God suppress the truth. They push it down. They do not honor God, verse 21. They're not thankful for all God has done, verse 21. And then the last and final charge, which is devastating. It's not that they didn't worship him as the creator, which they didn't, but they worship everything else. They worship every created thing. Rather than worshiping the uncorruptible God, they shifted and began to worship everything corruptible. And those are the four charges that Paul laid out about why God's wrath is being revealed. We then moved to talk about God's wrath. I told you it was in the present tense. We could have translated it like this. God's wrath is being revealed and continues to be revealed. Give that to Martha. And so then we begin to ask the question, okay, how is God's wrath being revealed? Okay, we get why. We saw the four charts, so we're crystal clear. We understand what, and let's be honest, it's not men over there. It's what I did before Christ. It's what every man has done before Christ. Paul's going to go through, he's going to build this case. God gave us internally the idea of right and wrong and we sometimes go against that god gave us a conscience we sometimes go against that god gave us the ability for moral reasoning and we sometimes even go against that and that's what paul's doing is laying us all guilty right there in front of god we're without excuse if we're thinking we're going to get to heaven if we're thinking things are going to be okay any other way than christ but he now starts to unpack how God's wrath in the present tense is being revealed in this, this three-fold, uh, forget that title, repetition that gets darker and darker, that gets deeper and deeper. Sin is the thing that leads to more sin. Sin is the consequence. Sin is the effect. Verse 24, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts. Verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind. And it's there we had the 21 sins, starting with ones that are very broad, getting ones to very narrow. And I said that wasn't an exhaustive list. That was just a representative list. That's what man does apart from God. Now this language when we hear God gave them up, God gave them up. God gave them up. It has this sense, and I've heard it preached this way, is that, well, God just says, I'm done with you. There's no hope for you. It's over. Too bad. Have a nice day. That's not the picture we should have. The picture we should have is sin leads to greater sin and greater darkness. And greater darkness leads to greater sin and greater darkness. And greater sin leads to greater sin and greater darkness. But the entire time, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to anyone who will believe. 
The entire time, the reason God is giving them over and allowing them to go deeper is so that in the depths of sin, they might see the calamity that they are involved in and do what? Repent and turn to God. Throughout the book of 1 Kings, what we saw over and over again is God would allow kings to go deeper and deeper and deeper with one goal. That in going there, they might see how desperate they are separated from God and cry out to him and flee back to him. And that was the point of application I made uh, as we were in this part. And I'll just read it so that I don't miss anything. I said, I do not want you to miss the larger point here. When God handed the nation of Israel over to her enemies, and we saw it various times in the Old, Des Old Testament, there was always a purpose, and that was to bring about repentance. The horror, of, the horror of the current situation was meant to drive them to cry out to God. Now, it was judicial. They were, getting, they were going deeper and deeper and receiving in themselves the consequences of their sins. But it was mercy-filled in that through all that, God was allowing calamity to come so that they might see their desperate need and cry out to him. And the same is true for you and I. This is the natural progression of man apart from the gospel of God. They suppress the truth, and we start seeing all of these things happen. So if you think about America, you say, yeah, I'm seeing all of these calamities happen. Well, that's what happens when men and women suppress the knowledge of God. It starts to go down that track. The good news is there's something that can pull it off the track, and it's the gospel. Because it is the dunamis. It is the power of God in true salvation. And that's Paul's whole point. And so with all that, uh, we ultimately read these five verses, made a lot of comments. I'm going to read them to say a few things to get us going this morning. And we will use this to springboard right into verse 6. So with that, I'm going to read these. I'm going to make sure there are no questions. And we're going to springboard into our verse this morning. So coming into chapter 2, if you remember, I told you that theologians believe that Paul, who's been making principal charges against the Gentiles... You Gentiles, and actually he's been using they. They, them, they, them, they, them, now shifts his attention to the Jews. He now begins to shift his finger, because the Jews have been over there going, Gretchen, that's right. That's right. These Gentiles have suppressed the knowledge of God. That's right, Paul. We agree wholeheartedly with you. I'm glad you're getting around to talking about these Gentiles. And now Paul's about to turn his finger to his Jewish brethren and say, guess what? You're guilty too. Except yours is more heinous because you had the word of God. They did. There's no half heinous. Yours is horrible. But let's get, jump into it. Verse 1. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself. Why? Because you, the judge, practice the very same thing. That is a condemnation against the Jews, and it's a condemnation against legalism and self-righteousness today. We've all seen people who will condemn this in others and then go out and do it and pretend God's going to be good with that. Paul's point is God is not at all good with that. Verse 2, we know, notice he brings himself into that program. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man... You who judge those who practice such things and then yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent, unrepentant heart, you are storing up, treasuring up wrath for yourself on the day of death when God's righteous judgment will be. Now, something else I want you to see. I told you he had been saying they and them, and then here in verse 1, and again, the chapters are assigned by man. But here in chapter 2, verse 1, notice what happens. He's no longer talking about plural they and them. He's talking about singular you. Again, theologians will tell us he's now using a rhetorical device to speak to an example or a sample Jew, which is going to apply to all the Jews. And so he's building this sample Jew to speak to him rhetorically as I would speak to a person. And you can see the repetition 13 times in five verses. You, yourself, your, and then, but Laurel had something back. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I think the battery's dead. Uh, do I have any couples here that would be willing to share their outline? Uh, we've got some. There we go. One. If I can have one more. Here you go, Mike. I'll print more next week. Yeah. And again, I'll email them out. I'll email them out. I think he's got enough. 
And I'll email the ones out for those who just handed theirs in. They'll be in part of the email that goes out today or tomorrow or whenever it goes out. Okay, so also finally before we jump into our verses, in these five verses we saw the first two principles about the righteousness of God. Principle number one, God judges according to truth. It's according to the reality of the matter. He is an impartial judge. And we saw that in verse three, right? You don't get to judge somebody else, practice the same things, and then go and do them and stand guiltless before God. Principle number two we saw about the righteousness of God is there is a judgment day coming for everyone. Now all of this, and I told you last week, if you were to, can you imagine being in Rome when this letter came and hearing these things? Your throat would have dried up. It would have gotten tough to swallow. It made a clicking sound when you tried to swallow. That's the whole point. Paul is using the righteousness of God and the law of God as the weight to show us how desperately, Jew or Gentile, we need Jesus Christ. Yes, George. question for you regarding judgment. If you have to call out behavior in the public square that you want to make change and you want to let the public know what's going on, is that considered judgment or is that considered uh, some other duty? So in the case of this, keep in mind what they were doing. They were not just saying, hey, that behavior is incorrect. They were saying that behavior is incorrect. And then they were going off and doing it themselves. You're wrong for what you're doing, Carol. And then I go off and do the same thing. You see, we are right to say what is wrong. And we are right to admit when we're wrong. We're right to say, and you know what? I'm guilty of the same thing. That's the honest answer. But that's not what was happening here. And you can see that. Do you suppose, oh man, you can judge those who practice those things and yet do them yourself? So you're quick to go, or this person, this example of Jew is quick to go, you're wrong, you're violating Yahweh's God, Yahweh's laws, and then they go off and do the same. That's what's condemned here. And that's a principle that God will judge according to truth. By the way, this should make us nervous apart from Christ. Apart from Christ, this should make us shake in our shoes. Yeah, Gretchen. This is so common of what Jesus would accuse the Pharisees of. And here Paul is leveling against this example Jewish person, which means it's going out to all the Jewish hearers, which means is it for every Jewish person that they're doing this? No, but many were. And he's sweeping them in. We can make the application today. This is what self-righteous people do. And God forbid that we would be a self-righteous person who would be busy finding fault in others and ignoring the fault in ourselves. That should serve as a great warning for us. Now, if you're born again, you're not going to be judged by God. You're not going to be cast into hell by God. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is let that weight of that statement weigh in on the reality of how we shouldn't be busy judging others. We should be looking for faults in ourselves and judging others. Anything else before we hit our verses? The blonde lady up front. Um, that just falls into the first category you were talking about last week about the people that they'll have a certain sin, but then they talk about it with others. That you know They point out other people that sin a whole lot. That they have themselves. Yeah, absolutely. That was the first category. And I didn't want—I don't want to repeat the examples of how people do that. But you're exactly right. That falls in that first category of how we attempt to deflect when we're involved in sin. That's one of the deflection mechanisms. And Paul gives a very severe warning about that behavior. Anything else before we get to our verses today and start running? Ethan, good morning. Okay, having the law being circumcised. Verse 6, here we go. He, that's God, will render to each one of you according to his works. I'll let that sink for a second. To those who, who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. The Jew first and also the Greek. I thought of you, Janice, wherever you are. Notice that tribulation is to the Jew first. Now the Jew doesn't want to be first in line. Guess what they are? And the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. The Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 11. For God shows no partiality. Now, before we unpack these verses, let's look at something at the 50,000-foot elevation, and that's the argument itself. This is a chiastic arrangement. A chiastic arrangement is where you say something, and then you restate the points in reverse order. And you can see what he did. Verse 6, God will judge equitably. That's point A. 
Those who do good will get eternal life. That's point B. Those who do evil will suffer wrath. That's point C. Now the chaotic argument. He will take the ABC structure and go CBA. Wrath for those who do evil, there's C. Glory for those who do good, there's B. Because God judges impartially. A chiastic argument. You're very familiar with these. They're common in Greek literature. They're common in the Bible. Whoever exalts himself, point A, will be humbled, point B. Whoever humbles himself, point B, will be exalted, point A. A chiastic argument. And here is used, Paul uses this for effect so that we get it. We understand what he's saying. God judges equity. That's the point. That's the main driving point we've looked at. To those who do good, eternal life. To those who do evil, wrath. To those who do evil, wrath. To those who do good, glory. God judges impartially. Now, this brings us to the third principle as we think about principles. And we saw it in the lead. He will render to each one according to his works. God judges based on our works. He judges, I said, according to the evidence. Now, if you're thinking, then how can any of us make it? Because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all that believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. You see, it's in the gospel by faith that we receive God's righteousness, not our own, because our own will not stand up to the our own will fall short. And that's the point that Paul is building. He's wanting every hearer to say this. If this is true, I'm not going to make it. Apart from Christ, that's right. But in Christ, that's the lifeboat. That's where we receive the righteousness of God by faith. But he's not ready to talk about that yet. He's still laying the law and the righteousness of God on each hearer. So that we understand our desperate condition. But that was principle three. We see it. But there's another thing I want you to see here. And it's the two fates. They're crystal clear. It's either eternal life in verse 7b. Or glory, honor, and peace as it's described in verse 10. Or it's wrath and fury in 8b. Tribulation and distress in 9. Now if you connect those words together. Wrath. Fury. Tribulation and distress. Let that sink in. That's what awaits men apart from Christ. That, that's what awaits all men and women because they've suppressed the knowledge of God. That's what awaits all men and women because of, of their sins. That's what awaits them. Verse 6. He, God, will render, the idea is pay a debt to everyone, a debt that's based according to their works. That's taught throughout the Bible. But now let's talk about something else. These verses are really, commentators handle these in various ways. Ranging from teaching you can, works are going to save you, which clearly that's not Paul's point. You have to rip this stuff out of context to get there. But the question is, what argument is he making? And really, I think there's one of two that are consistent with the Bible that he could be making here. Argument number one is what I believe. He is building the point that if, if you're going to make it on works, then your works must be perfect. But you can't make it. Yeah, that's right. So guess what? You can't be, right? There's none righteous. No, no. Now, some theologians, but he's making this argument because he wants you to go, I can't make it. God, I can't do that. Good news. I've got a life goal. His name is Christ. Other theologians will say, no, no, what he's building is a picture of uh, the character of those who've been saved. In other words, that they are now righteous before God. Now, that is true, but I don't think that's what Paul's doing at this point. So what I did to help you sort through this in your mind is I gave you three quotes from Bible teachers, theologians who believe that what Paul's saying is he's talking about having godly character, and that's really what he's pointing to. And then I gave you three, three theologians who really are with me. Who are teaching, no, no. What he's doing is laying out the rigid law. And saying, if you think this is going to get you there, then you got to be perfect. That's the only way you'll make it. Now, are both points true? Yeah, absolutely. When we are saved by God's grace, we are given a new character and a new, new nature. We are new creatures. We are born again. We, we change our walk. We start desiring things we previously did not desire. We want to please our Father. That's absolutely true. 
As for those three theologians who hold that position, that's true. I just don't think that's what he means in this context. So it's not that what they say is not true. It is. I just don't think that's his point. I think he's taking the law so that every man will have their, their mouth go shut. You know how quiet it is right here? That's, I think, his point. Nobody has a word to say. You're going to be judged by your works. They better be perfect for you to make it. But I do give you a total of six theologians. But again, I would say do not miss what's happening. The apostle is using the full rigor of the law to those who sought to be justified by the law. That's the Jew's point. You see, the Jews always thought, and you see this throughout the ministry of Jesus, that because they were God's covenant people, that was going to protect them on judgment day. They thought, we have the law and we have circumcision. And we can do whatever we want, and in the end, we're, we're, we're not going to be judged. We saw throughout the Old Testament just the opposite. We saw even a king who was a Jew and circumcised, and plenty of them, who rebelled against God, got in trouble with God. Because they were breaking God's covenant that he made with them. And so Paul is doing that really to speak to the Jews and to remind them, verse 11... God shows no partiality. Yeah, man. Now, I know, like, my, my worker has a, like a paragraph break from five to six. But if you don't take, if you do it without the paragraph break, couldn't six be an ending statement to one through five of, I mean, to put this as one, without that paragraph break, as one statement, one through eleven, it makes more sense. It's a if you keep doing the work you're doing that I talked about in one through five, this is that is what he's gonna judge you on is your behavior even at that point. Does that make any sense? I think so. And and I guess, you know, wherever the break is, it's all man made. We do know in Greek this is a chaotic argument. We recognize that these these verses together form an argument. From the positive to the negative, negative to positive. We understand that. We see it. It's easy to recognize in the Greek. Um, equally, you can see the argument he's building because he leads with a prayer. And he ends with it. This overarching point that God is impartial. You see, that's where the Jews were missing it. They were thinking this, God's partial. That's the whole point. God, God's actually partial. And because we're the covenant people, he's not going to judge us like he judges everyone. But this would be like saying, because I'm a Baptist, God's not going to judge me like he judges those Lutherans. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> that's why it's so full here. Uh, you know, uh, but we all do get judged. Absolutely. And our works get judged. The believers who are sound in Christ, they will be judged. Their works, and you may have a crown. Uh, you, you'll be saved. Uh, I don't know. Is it called the bema seat or something like that? Or yeah, people do. right. Uh, and and so, kind of following what Matt was saying, uh, going with this this uh, kind of what they say a fortiori argument that we're talking about specific works of people, and there's some that fall off and do bad works and so forth and so on then come to verse 6 he's going to render according to works that's for all of us our works mm -hmm. and some are reprobate and they're not in heaven their judgment is to e uh, eternal damnation but to those who by patience uh, in well doing are doing these good works um, it, because they're seeking glory and honor in immortality. He gives eternal life. Not, not that that's the exchange, like works for eternal life, but that uh, this is the eternal life. That in my father's house, there's many mansions. There's, there's blessings according to the works that's that true. the believer does. And so that I'm thinking this is less um, works unto salvation versus this is works unto 
blessings in heaven. I, I guess I'm not explaining it well, but uh, well, let's look at his next point, and I'll see, and see if it fits your argument. And again, we'll jump in verse it just so you can read it. For, okay, we're coming to a conclusion. For all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law. And all who have sinned with the law shall be judged by that law. There's the conclusion. The conclusion of the matter is he now lumps everybody into two categories. Those who only had general revelation, never had the word of God. And those who had the word of God, the Jews, you and I. And he comes to two conclusions. If you sin without the law, guess what happens to you? You perish without the law. If you sin just against general revelation, just the fact that the heavens were declaring the glory of God, just that the firmament was showing forth his handiwork, that's all you sin against. And your conscience, and the fact that he made you in his image, and the fact that he put in your heart what is right and wrong, and the fact that he gave you moral reason. You'll bust out that. And I'm going to go to Sandy and then Linda. Because we've jumped ahead to our verses here, and I didn't want to go there. Then we'll go back. Um, or, or if you sin <laughs> under the law, that's the Jew, then you'll be judged by that law. Now we should all hear that and recognize I'm in one of those camps. Because I'm one of two categories, whichever place I want to put myself. I happen to be in category B. If I'm seeking to be justified by my works, there's one way to me. There's my answer. If, on the other hand, I flee to the gospel of Christ, wherein the righteousness of God is provided to me by faith, then I have a secure foundation. Because all of my sins were placed upon him, and he paid the debt for every one of them. And I will not be judged to hear, and this is what Paul's going to in Romans chapter 3. I told you he's taking the weight of the law and the weight of the righteousness of God, so every one of us goes, I'm ruined. Okay, so now we have Sandy, then Linda, then in the back. <laughs> when you first start reading that, it looks like that God's going to judge you on everything that you've done wrong, but um, you know, it says that when um, he forgives you, he remembers your sin no more. He casts it from the east to the west. And um, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us our, our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I think that's an ongoing process. So, so if we're worried about, you know, something we did yesterday, you know, if, if God has put on our heart, we need to ask forgiveness for that. We do. I think it's an ongoing thing. So, I, truthfully, I'm not worried about every little thing, you know, as long as God corrects me along the way. Because um, because I, I can't depend on myself. I'm having to depend on his righteousness. God is not giving us the solution here, y'all. God is explaining the problem. In Romans 3, we're going to get the solution. Right now, Paul is laying out, and every one of us, we're all, I can sense it, we're all sensing the problem and going, yeah, but I'm trying to walk with Christ. I agree. You've been born again. You have a new heart, new nature. And I would argue that Romans 8 is what I would tell you. There is therefore now no condemnation, no condemning sentence to those who are in Christ Jesus. You've been born again. You have God's righteousness, and he paid your debt for your sins, past, present, oh, and the ones you will sin tomorrow. My thought was, it's the origin of your works. Are they fleshly, or do they come from the Holy Spirit? And see, Linda, that's where three, the first three theologians I quoted, that they would agree with you. They would say, that's what Paul's getting at. And you're ready for this? Paul could be getting at both points. You're ready for this? We're talking about these two polemics. Paul could be making the argument that both of these things are true. Again, quite common in the Greek to have multiple points. No, I think that was covered, but um, I, I still go to that uh, being judged by your work because uh, Scripture, uh, I've read so much Scripture that says you're not. Um, and I, my, my problem is trying to figure out whether I'm doing things for my recognition or for God. So let's say it again, because Paul is not talking about the solution. He's talking about the problem. The solution is the gospel. Yes, yeah, see, we're wanting to weave in the solution here with the problem. What Paul's doing is making sure that his readers sense the weight of the problem. Jew or Gentile, 
Because each one of them in that room, when they read this letter for the first time, should have been going, well, wait a minute. As, this, as, these re as they're reading what came in, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. But then all of a sudden, at 321 and 22, we're going to turn the corner. And we're going to talk about the righteousness of God that is by faith. And that's when we turn the corner and the whole dam breaks down. And now we start talking about the gospel and we move on from there. But right now, Paul's dammed up on the problem. And we're all sensing the way. I sense the way to it when I read. <laughs> Let's keep. And, and if you notice in my notes, so Scott said something that was funny. I said in my notes, you know, I would like to just skip all this. I would. God didn't skip it. This is heaven. And God intended every one of us to sense this way, even born again, to remember who we were before Christ found us, to remember our plight before we were born again, to remember where we were headed before we were redeemed. And so this is absolutely necessary. So anything else before we advance this argument, a lot of great discussion, and thank you. See, this is the stuff that will be on the, on the camera that we never have from my desk when I do this. Okay. Verse 12, sort of let the cat out of the bag, but you see the conclusion or the summary for all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Whether it was the light of nature that you suppressed, whether it was the fact that you were made in the image of God and God had written right and wrong in your heart that you were suppressing, whether it was your conscience and your moral reasoning that you were suppressing, or whether it was the word of God that you were rejecting, doesn't matter. You see the conclusion. In either case, the same conclusion happens. Verse 13, here we go again, James. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who shall be justified. Dikaios, the, the idea is have a right standing before God. Now again, I don't think what Paul's saying is, okay, you're going to be saved by what you do. I don't think after everything we've read, he's coming to that conclusion. I think he's still building the same point. Okay, if you think you're going to be justified by your works, Mr. Jewish person, sample example Jewish person, if that's your conclusion, then they better be perfect. They better be like Jesus because that's the standard. And when you read it with that understanding, we understand what he's saying. Now look, he keeps building on this point. Look at it as he goes on in verse 14 and 15. For when the Gentiles, who do not have the written law, do by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. Now you see what he said. He said, so when the Gentiles, who do not have the written law, do what is right, they show that somehow they have the law. Look at his next verse. Verse 15, they show the work of the law is written on their hearts. You see, when Gentiles, when people like you and I before coming to Christ did what was right, you know what we were showing? That God had written it in our hearts. We were, our bad behavior is now condemning us because our good behavior is proving God had written in our hearts right and wrong. Now, was the image busted? Yeah, because of the fall was were things messed up? A absolutely. But follow Paul's continuing argument. They show the mark of the law written on their hearts while their conscience bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or excuse them. Moral reasoning, sometimes it says that was wrong and you do it anyway. Sometimes it says that was right and you knew it was right. In either case, for the person who doesn't have the written law, what you're showing is all the ways that God wrote the truth in your heart and life. In my heart and life. The heavens are declaring his glory. He's written right and wrong in my heart. He's given me a conscience that I would understand right and wrong. That I would understand what is sin against him and what is sin against my neighbor. And he's given me moral reasoning so I can even reason my way through it. And yet I don't always come to the right conclusion, but the whole thing proves I'm answerable to God. And that's Paul's point. Their conflicting thoughts either accusing them or excusing them. Now it's here also in verse 16. I want you to see it. We get another principle. <coughs> he will judge even the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know about you. I don't want my secrets brought up. 
I've got a long list of secrets before I was saved. I've got a long train of sins that I was involved in before I was converted. But imagine, if you think through self-righteousness you're going to stand before God, then here's principle number five. Or we'll number four, forgive me. On judgment day, God's going to judge the secrets of every unrepentant sinner. Man, I don't want to stand there in my own works because they will not do it. And I don't know anyone who will and anyone who does. And that brings us to the fifth point. You saw it right there. Not only that, but the fifth and final principle that he makes is God judges by Christ Jesus. He's not just the lone Savior, the only Savior. He is the ultimate judge. He is the one to whom every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father, Philippians 2. And I give you a host of verses there um, about Jesus Christ being the only, uh, the sole judge. I remember well, I was uh, attending a church in Cocoa Beach, and you guys know how I memorize verses. I make little business cards and I keep them in my vehicle and I just read through them. Um, and I had John 5, 26, I think through 28 is the address. Uh, Jesus said, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. For as the Father has life in himself, he's given the Son who has life in himself, and he's given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. The youth pastor was riding in my truck and he was playing with my cards. And he picked that up and he was reading 526 and he goes, I didn't know this. And I said, know what? That Jesus is the judge? I thought God was the judge. I'm like, no, no. God the Father has given God the Son the authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man, the fifth principle. Jesus is the ultimate judge who will judge all things. And he'll judge rightly. We've now seen the five principles. He judges according to truth. It's, he's impartial. He's inflexible. And that brings us to the end of verse 16. And any other thoughts, discussion, I give you some verses to look at there. But anything else, as we wrap it up, to these points, and here's Paul's points. We're now under the full weight and righteousness of God and God's law. The heavens declared his glory, we suppressed it. Our hearts knew right and wrong, we often excused it. Our conscience spoke silently to us, we regularly sinned against it. We've been given moral reasoning, we at times twisted it. On top of that, the Jew of Paul's day and you and I, everyone in this room, has the word of God. And the religious person, rather than placing faith in Christ and running to the lifeboat that God has provided, will attempt to justify themselves. And in so doing, they're frequently breaking God's law and never obtaining God's righteousness by faith. We're going to go to Matt and then Grace as we wrap up these verses. Um, if you go back to the hmm? verse, verse 13, I think it's better for those first three uh, commentaries we had. Uh, it's not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law that will be justified to the fact of it's not just hearing and accepting Christ, it's the doing, you know, you can't just say, oh yeah, and then go back to your old life or never ever do the Great Commission or never speak. It's, it's not just hearing about Christ, it's the doing of Christ that, that helps justify you. Not that those works actually justify you, but those that you, you understand what I mean by that's where you're showing that you actually, that's where your physical, that's where it is visible that you have accepted, that you've changed. So number one, that's absolutely true. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There's no doubt that that point is true. But listen to what Paul says. And again, it may be both points. And I get it. All who sin without the law will perish without the law. That's every Gentile. That's every human being who doesn't have the law of God. All who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. That's every other human being who was not in blockade. We now have every human being, what I think Paul is trying to do, under the condemnation of God. Every human being should be squirming right now as they read these verses. And they should be crying out to God, I need another way, because this one won't get done. And we're going to go to Grace and then Luke. Back in Genesis, when Abraham believed, it was counted to him as righteousness. Right? Faith. <laughs> in Romans, I mean, yeah, in Romans 2, what I think Paul is trying to show is that 
the Jewish people took the law and they made it a, a way of salvation when it wasn't intended to be the way of salvation. So I think Paul is kicking apart that platform and saying, you won't stand. You won't stand on that. And so if we go to your point, Grace, in Galatians chapter 3, Paul said the law was a schoolmaster, too, depending on your version, to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. You see, the law was not, the law can't make anybody righteous. All it can do is say, you're guilty. This was the standard. You came up short. And that's every one of us in this room. That's all it can do. There's no remedy. There's no solution. It highlights the problem. Inflexible, perfect law of God. Rich broke it. The end. Case closed. Guilty before God. Oh, but that was meant that I would flee to Christ to receive his righteousness by faith. But Linda, you have an answer. Psalm 19, verse 12. Who can discern his lapses and his errors? Clearly from my hidden and unconscious faults. That's what I mean. Yeah, it turns out we have more faults than we do know, huh? <laughs> you know, I think that's true for all of us. Remember when you first got saved? God was just dealing with the big things in your life. And as you've grown in grace, God starts to touch those little things that seemed okay back then. You didn't think about them. And now God's saying, you know, I want that behavior change. I think I want to get control of that thought habit. And so you're exactly right, Linda. It seems that God has us on a growing plan, and he's just exposing things to us as we grow in grace with him. Things that he wants to change in our life. But here's the deal. We are just, we're in the right standing before God by faith. That growth, that sanctification, to use the biblical term, is happening because we've been born again. But we're not waiting on that so that we can be saved. We're saved already. And in fact, it's because we're saved that we're now hotly pursuing God, because we're a new creature in Christ. By the way, I told you guys this was as deep as anything gets. This is as deep as the New Testament gets. This is what Peter said Paul's thoughts are sometimes hard to understand. And that was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ who said that. Anything else before we advance his argument even further? He's not done blowing our mind yet, by the way. If you think your mind's blown already, don't worry. He's not done. Not even close. Yes, James. I don't like Yes, you do. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> what about those who haven't heard of the law? Yeah, so this is, see, so we talked about this last week. It's a great question, Jess. Right, if we're sharing the gospel with people, every now and again, Tim, someone's going to say this. We're going to say, hey, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And they'll say, yeah, but what about those people on that island way over there in way never, never land who've never heard about Jesus? How can this be fair? You're setting up this condition where they've got to believe in someone to be saved that they've never heard about. Has Paul mentioned Jesus' name at all here in the problem? As he's talking about the problem, he's going to mention Jesus plenty when he gets to the solution, y'all. But he's not talking about the solution. He's talking about the problem. All of us, apart from Christ, suppress the knowledge of God. Isaiah 53 said it this way. All we like sheep had gone astray. We had each turned to our own way. Now, it was not enough that we began. We sinned against God. We suppressed his knowledge. We didn't worship him. We weren't thankful to him. We didn't honor him. We turn and personalize sin in our own lives. We are guilty before God, y'all. Jesus' name didn't need to be mentioned for our guilt. The heavens were declaring his glory, and we were ignoring and suppressing. So I hope that answers your question, Janice, at least how Paul would answer it. He wants all men guilty before God. Because they've rejected all the ways that God has attempted to reveal himself, including inside them. With moral reason, conscience, and the right and wrong being written in the heart. And they've suppressed, rejected, peeled apart, and pushed back all of those ways. And, oh, and worse, everyone who has the Bible has even pushed back that much more. But all are guilty. And we go back to his summary statement. For those who sin without the law, whoever sin it, they wretched, shall perish without the law. And those who sin under the law shall be judged by the law. And I would argue that what Paul's doing is he wants all of us to go, there's no hope. Oh, but there is. <laughs> Get yourself. We, we all have a conscience. I don't care who you are, where you are in the world, we all have a conscience. And that is supposed to lead us to the Lord. But when God started healing me, 
and I started arguing with him that I, you know, I'm not, it's not my fault because I'm the victim. And, it, and God very gently told me, yes, you are. But let me tell you how you're contributing to staying a victim. So somewhere in there, we are all responsible for whatever it is that we do, whatever it is that we say, whatever it is that we keep hidden because of shame and guilt or whatever. And whatever, it, how we choose to honor God with our lives because he's the creator. We're just creation. And you just have to submit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you must wait, brother. What significance is there, if any, to the clause according to my gospel? Don't you love that? So I didn't touch upon that. But don't you, you know, Paul has been referring to God's gospel, the gospel of God, and here he refers to it as my gospel. I wrote in my notes, is it my gospel? Am I so identified with the gospel of Jesus Christ that it's not just the gospel of Christ, it's just not God's gospel. The Greek word is euangelion, it means good news, it means glad tidings. It's not just God's good news, it is Rich's gospel. It is your gospel, it is our gospel. And that's what I think he's getting at, James. I, I skipped over it, because again, we can't run everything. It's, it's mine, I've embraced it. I'm not just an articulator, a bloviator of the gospel, I'm an adherent, a clutcher to someone who clings to the gospel. Let's go back. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. We said that could have been a literary device where what he's actually saying is I boast only in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. My only hope, I'm all into the gospel. If the gospel doesn't, isn't the answer, there's no answer. I'm all in. I'm all chips in on the gospel. But is it our gospel? That's the question we would derive from that, James, I think is the point that he's making. Anything else? Okay. Start look at that. Verse 17. Okay, here we go as he continues to really, we'll just skip this, as he continues to unpack. Verse 17. But if you call yourself a Jew, now this is the first time he came out and said it. He's been saying, you and your and yourself, he now just finally says it. What he's been implying, he now just cuts right to the chase. This example Jewish person that he dare not name, he just named here in verse 17. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God. Okay, so three points there. They're real quick. You call yourself a Jew. So we talked about this in Kings. If you remember, they were originally called Hebrews. They were Israelites. Then there was the northern tribes who split from the southern tribes. The ten northern tribes began to refer, be referred to from that point on as Israelites. And the two southern tribes began to refer, be referred to as Judah, collectively as a Jew. And we see that in Esther. It's about 500 B.C., 485, when that term starts to be used to refer to those two southern tribes. By the time Jesus comes on the scene, that term has replaced Israelite and Hebrew. It's a common term to refer to Jews as those who descended from Abraham, those who descended from the patriarchs, those who are part of the 12 tribes. He said, you call yourself a Jew, you rely on the law. That means to rest on the law. That's to lean on the law. That's the idea. You call yourself a Jew and you're relying on the law and you're boasting in God. Now, those are all good things, right? And every Jew would be in the room going, yeah, that's me. I am a Jew. I'm relying on the law. I'm boasting in God, but let's keep reading. They're like, yeah, that's us, Paul. Verse 18, you know his will. Is that true for the Jew? Absolutely. Gnosko is the Greek word. It means to know, to understand, to perceive. And you approve what is excellent because you were instructed in the law. <coughs> Those five points, they would have said, that's exactly right, George. That's me. That's my Jewishness. That's who I am. Verse 19. Now, Paul shifts from discussing the five advantages the Jews had because of their covenant relationship with God to five prerogatives. And he gets rough now. Verse 19 and 20. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, James, they would have said, yes, we have the word of God. We're a guide to the blind. A light to those who are in darkness. They would have said, amen. Now, were they truly being a light to the Gentiles? No. 
No, but let's follow his argument. Don't worry, he's going to get to it quick enough. But you, you would say, I'm a light to, the dark, and to those who are in darkness? They would say yes. Verse 20, an instructor of the foolish? Absolutely. A teacher of children and childlike behavior? Absolutely. Having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, the form, the grasp, the full expression? Right there in the law, that's them. Yes, that's us, Paul. Man, you're right, that is us. Verse 21. You then who teach others, do you teach yourself? A rhetorical question. And what do you think Paul's driving at for the answer? You don't. In this example Jewish person, you don't. Now, did every one of them do all of these things? No. But these things are going to catch every one of them. It's a rhetorical trap that's going to capture all of them. Verse 21b, while you're preaching against stealing, do you steal? Rhetorical question, implying you do. You're breaking the law, but don't worry, he's going to get to it. Verse 22, you who say one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Well, he's not even talking in light of what Jesus said about adultery. We're all guilty there. <laughs> he's dealing with a much basic, much broader sense. But you get what he's saying. The answer would be some of you are. You that abhor idols, do you rob temples? Now that's a little bit different, so let's talk about that. So the Jews hated idolatry, monotheistic, claimed to hate idolatry, although we saw plenty of it within the nation in the book of Kings. Uh, but his point is, you claim to hate idolatry, but something that was very common in antiquity, and that was to rob from pagan temples. He says, to you, so you seem to hate idolatry, but you don't have any problem profiting from robbing from pagan temples and selling their goods. That seems to be his point, which is in a sense being connected to idolatry. What exactly point he's making, we don't know, but you get the point. He's saying you're guilty of doing something. Verse 23, you boast in the law, yet you dishonor God in breaking the law. He could have took the mic and done this. Dropped it right on the floor. You claim all of these things. You claim to have the embodiment of truth contained in the law. Yet you dishonor God. These Jewish who are hearing this by breaking his law. That's Paul's point. Verse 24. As it's written. He's going to quote either Isaiah or Ezekiel. But let's get the point. As it's written, the name of God is blasphemed. It's reviled. It's railed against. It's reproached. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Imagine being a Jewish reader sitting there the first time this letter was read in the, in the church home you were at. You're listening. What's Paul, my brother, got to say to me? And he says that. That is as rough as it gets. Now, this is a quote from either Isaiah 52, 5 or Ezekiel 36. I went ahead and grabbed Ezekiel 36. I'll just read it real quick just to make some comments so that you see it. This is the prophet Ezekiel speaking. He said, the word of the Lord came to me, the word of Yahweh, son of man. When the house of Israel lived in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their ways before me were like the uncleanness of a woman in her menstrual impurity. Is that a graphic picture of the uncleanness of the nation of Israel? That's not Rich's definition. That's God's definition. Verse 19. Excuse me, verse 18. So I poured out my wrath upon them for the blood that they had shed in the land and for the idols with which they had defiled it. I scattered them among the nations. Did he do that? Absolutely. Assyrian captivity in 722 B.C. He scattered the ten northern tribes. Babylonian captivity in 586 B.C. He sent the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, into Babylonian captivity. Because of their sins, their idolatry. But what was the always the end game with God and letting them go off into sin? That they would repent. It's the same story we're seeing here in Romans 1. That they would repent and turn back to him. Verse 20. Now this is bad enough, Scott. There's enough charges here to last the Jews for the, We're guilty, right? But when they, that's the Jews, came to the nations 
wherever they came, they profaned my holy name, in that the people said to them, these are the people of Yahweh, and yet they've gone out of the land. Not only did they worship idols, not only did they sin against God, not only were they as guilty and defiled as the surrounding nations whom God had judged when he gave them the land, but even in captivity, they did not repent, Gretchen, and continued in their sins and blasphemed God's holy name among the Gentiles. And that is what Paul is reminding his Jewish readers here of. Again, I suspect if you were a Jew sitting there that day for the first time, George, your throat would have dried up. It would have been hard to swallow, and you would not have known what to say. Anything else as you look at these verses in the charge? <laughs> Isn't that what uh, we today receive as Christians, um, churchgoers, uh, that the Gentiles, that we'll call it the non-believers out there, uh, currently say that, well, the reason why I don't go to church is uh, because they're hypocrites. Yeah. And this is the essence of it. They, if, if they were smart, they could say, you need to be. churchgoers are blaspheming the name of God. I ain't going to your church. Isn't that kind of what's going on? The difference is in this case... So I would like to hope that in many cases when they level a charge against First Baptist Spurgeon Union, that they're not going to come here because it's filled with hypocrites. That actually those charges are very trumped up. And what we have is a group of believers who are doing the best they can to walk with God. And who would never be judging them for their sins and who would be open to say, oh, you're doing that? Yeah, I used to do that. I was caught in that. I was involved in that. When God found me, I was doing that. I know, I know exactly what you're up to. You know, God can help you with that. God can deliver you from that. But it's just judgment waits on people who do those things, who don't profess faith in Christ. But see, what they were doing, as you look at this context, is they were living just like them. No difference. I, would, I really, truly believe there is a difference. I don't think you come here to listen to Romans 1 and 2 because there's no difference. I tend to believe, as I think about the truth seekers, as I pedal through your names when I pray... It's a group of believers who loves the Lord. It's a group of believers who's listening to God's word. It's a group of believers who's being <laughs> instructed by God's word, wanting to walk with him in the details of their life. It's a group of believers who would never say, oh yeah, I'm perfect and you're broken. Rather they would say, I'm broken. And God's working on me. And God's fixing things. And let me tell you how he can do it with you too. So I hope you see the nuance difference. Yeah. Change the Christian church. But just change the church up. What's the one that's running the pride camp uh, in the summer? We have to speak against it. Um, someone looking on would say, wait a minute. That's, 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 is that not blasphemy of God? And, and want to walk from the whole mob. I'm not talking. Anyway, just talk. And again, we have to speak about sin. Even when it's in our life. Wherever we find the person. Mike, Mike, Mike. Were the Jews expected to be evangelicals? Absolutely. They were always expected to bring the nations in. And that's what they did not do. They huddled up. Rather than bringing the nations in, they began to point fingers at the nations. Oh, we're not like you. We're not like you. Well, was that like, oh, look, we're chosen people. We're pride? It is. And it can be pride in us too, Chris, right? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just wondering because they were supposed to bless all the nations. nations, so that means that they were supposed to talk about God, but they didn't. They hoarded the, the blessings. So that's our job, right? That is our job. Go you into all the world, and teach the nations. See, I'm just going to kind of agree with I think James, James. Um, that. Some of the things that hurt the church the worst are like when you have the, like the, the preachers on TV and stuff like that are very well known, and they'll be preaching against you know like sexual sin or something, and then they themselves are, and so that is a big thing that the world will come back on. It doesn't just go on that preacher; it goes on all believers. They because he does that, everybody else does that. So it it, it is a more than believers. It's blaspheming God. It's blaspheming God, and that's the key. 
I mean, but that's what they, that's what they say. And when that happens, we need to be open and say that was sin. Right? We shouldn't cover up, hide, pretend it didn't happen. That was sin. And here's our response. Rich, I appreciate your optimism. But I am certain that I'm going to walk out of church today and sin somehow you are. throughout my day. There's your number and, and, and just and like we talked about previously, is if everybody has that feeling, you said that that knowing that there is a God, right? That's built into us. Then, then others who see us, you know, like my experience right now is with my kids, specifically with my son. You know, he's watching every tiny move I make with a with a microscope you know and so when i when i fall away from god which will happen because of sin that's the thing that he attract you know that's he, that there's a notice there more so than the, than the you know six or seven thing because those are the things that we often talk about we often talk about the negative the negative things that we do we and those get highlighted so i i agree with james and and that you know ann and i have talked about this a bunch we are doing that I mean, we are blaspheming God by not not intentionally, but by going forward and not you know not talking about the fact that we sin as well as you know anybody else. So let's run with it. John is crystal clear on the answer to this. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What is hypocrisy is when we hide our sins and we cover our sins. And we pretend we did not sin. That is detrimental to our kids. Because then we justify our sins. Because then our kids see, oh, I see. It's all the same. But when our children and our neighbors and in one another, we see, you know what? What I did to you was wrong. And I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I've asked God to forgive me and I'm asking you to forgive me. That should be how we approach sin. Open, transparent. God forgive me. You forgive me. Because guess what? I can explain that to the world. I can explain, yes, what I did was wrong. I gossiped about my brother and I was wrong. And I've asked him to forgive me and I've asked God to forgive me. And I'm asking you to forgive me because I never should have said that about him. I was wrong. That was sin. So I think that transparency helps us immensely with each other and with our family members. That's when we don't do that, then we tell a different story. And we've got John and then Scott. Uh, along with transparency would be an enormous dose of humility because exactly what we're saying here everybody's saying is is true so from the point that roger made over to james and everything we when we point at somebody that it is the old adage right we've got a bunch of fingers pointing back and we're no better than anybody else and in, and in this gospel, I think what Paul does also with that my gospel is he's dropping breadcrumbs of truth to kind of make that person pay more attention in the sense of, yeah, while this is brutal, we are a depraved creation, like in the sense of, apart from God, I have a gospel. I have an answer. And, and it's, yes, I have good news. And it's continuing slowly because, like what Roger said, is really important. I don't know anybody that's going to walk around in the street and be a homeless person or just a lost person in general and stop you know, railing on them. You sinner, you this, you that. Do you think they're going to come to Christ that way? No, no. Because, again, what we're saying about going into church every day, if, if somebody walked out of this church and had that accusation, they're not doing their job in this church. Because we should understand in this class, and then with the teaching of Pastor Zach and others, that humility, that they're, but for the grace of God, go they're out. And, and so we have to just keep that paramount. Amen. We'll take it off. Oh, that was it? Yeah, let's be honest. If any man says he has no sin, he is a liar, liar and the truth of God is liar. not in him. Yeah, we can't. Did you hear your husband? Again, our works are not going to get us there. It's his work at Calvary. Our righteousness is not going to get us there. It's his righteousness given to us by faith. That's the only righteousness. That's the only thing that's going to work for us. But let's get to the last verses today. This will be the first time in a good long time we might finish our target verses in the lesson. You guys should like rejoice and say hallelujah. Rich did it. 
He's talking to Jews. He's about to lay it out. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Whoa. Paul, because you can imagine, well, what about we have the written law and we have circumcision? Now, did circumcision as a sign of the covenant have value? Absolutely. Did having the law of God have value? Absolutely. Was the value that because you had those things, you could act however you wanted and you weren't going to be judged by God for it? No. No. It was that leap that was all wrong. Did these things have value? Of course. Does having the Bible in your native language have value? Absolutely. You know the word of God. You know the will of God. You know God's demands and expectations. But does having it and not read it do you any good? No. Or does having it read it and doing the opposite do you any good? No, of course not. And that's Paul's point. You're boasting in circumcision. But if that's the boast, if the value is in all circumcision, then guess what? You've got to obey the whole law. And when you disobey, it's considered uncircumcised. Now, was, did they literally get uncircumcised? No, of course not. We're not talking about a physical miracle happening here. We're talking about a spiritual reality that you're, you're operating as if you were uncircumcised. Or to be even more specific, he's going to get to uncircumcised in your heart, which is really the bigger issue. Verse 25b, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. This language comes out of all over. I'll just give you one. This is Jeremiah 9, 25 and 26. Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will punish all those who are circumcised merely in the flesh. Who's circumcised merely in the flesh? Those of the nation of Israel, but they did not know God. They did not have a relationship with God. They just had the mark and no relationship. They're circumcised in the flesh only, but not here where it really matters. Look what God goes on to say. Egypt, Judah, Edom, the sons of Ammon, Moab, and all who dwell in the desert, who cut the corners of the hair. For all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in their heart. I looked across my nation, he said, and the vast majority of them, although circumcised in their flesh, are uncircumcised in their heart. They don't know me. They don't have a relationship with me. They don't even care. And judgment day is coming. And that's his point. And that is rough as it gets Eighth day, eighth day for men children, they were circumcised by the law on the eighth day. No doubt they worked hard to obey the law. They would have been circumcised on the eighth day. Make comment about in their heart. How does a child? Great question. The picture that the Bible paints is when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, a circumcision occurs. To use this metaphor, and it's a circumcision of our heart. We are born again. We are given a new heart and a new nature. God's spirit comes to live within us and to abide in us. Those are all similar language and pictures of what happens when a lost person with an uncircumcised heart, a heart of stone, repents and places faith in Jesus. He's given, that use that metaphor, a heart of flesh. He's circumcised in the heart, although he's not circumcised in his body. Man or woman, obviously not women. He's born again. He's a new creature in Christ. Those are all the pictures of what happens. And what his point is here is circumcision alone will not do it. Unless you're going to obey the law, which no one can. And he's going to go on to make the point, so let's build it. So let me read, let's, go ahead, let's just read the whole thing so you get it. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? So he asked a rhetorical question to kind of get them thinking. He goes, but what if, but what if um, someone who's not circumcised is able to perfectly keep the law of God? Now, no one can, but he's just building an argument. Would not their uncircumcision be counted as circumcision before God? We get what he's saying. He's building an argument. He's saying, well, if a person is not circumcised but lived a perfect life, wouldn't they be viewed as circumcised by God? And the obvious conclusion is surely, verse 27. Then he who is physically uncircumcised, this make a believe person, but he keeps the law, will condemn you who has the written code and circumcision but break the law. He said, so guess what? 
We go back to a principle we had already. He's going to judge men by their works, by their heart, by whatever we want to understand those verses. Verse 28. For no one who is a Jew who is one merely, no one who, no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter, whose praise is not for men, but from God. Guess what he just did in a drop the mic a bit for the Jews? He said the real circumcision is not physical, it's spiritual. It's a metaphor, whoever just said that word. It's done by the spirit. It's not about outward obedience to the law, which you're not keeping. It's about what God does in the heart. And then he really does a mind blow. And he is not a Jew nationally based on his lineage and that's all. He is a Jew which is one inwardly who's repented of his sins and placed faith in Jesus Christ. Regardless of the literal nation he comes from. And this would have been a mind blow for our Jewish friends hearing Paul say that to them. And we've got to wrap it up. So I'll, are there any closing thoughts, questions or anything? On what we just said, we'll end with George. I'm sorry, Gretchen, you emailed the question. We'll send it out. Okay. We get quick. I'm sorry. I just has been burning. Rich has asked for prayer, and we're all here. Can we lay hands on him at the end of class? We can definitely lay hands on Brother Rich and pray. Last couple, you come up. You can come up. Let's pray for him right now. George. George is going to give a comment. Ethan, quick. Quick question. Did you this question? I might see Brother and I use this from your recent question. Things like the circumcision law and some of the food laws from the Jewish religion really were based on sanitary procedures rather than religious significance, yet they seem to have religious significance in the right? What we come to realize is that everything in the Old Testament has religious significance. You see, even the things that we looked at and seemingly, oh, that had no religious significance, it all has religious significance. Remember when we were going through the tabernacle? And I was showing you all the pieces and how they had religious significance today. The Bible is, Old Testament is loaded with New Testament religious significance. The volume of the book is written about Christ. Please come up and if you're going to pray for me, I'll stand here. And you guys pray and we're going to wrap up with that. I'll sit in a chair. Um, in Jesus' name, we just pray for Rich, for his vertigo, his big God, the name of Jesus. Touch him, heal him, Lord God, whatever it is. We just pray for your healing, your continued healing, and it never happens again. We believe in Jesus' name. We receive it for a healing in his life forever and ever. In Jesus' name we agree and believe. Amen. 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 Yes. God bless you. I think we have to take the chairs down, right? We, we did. Right God bless you guys. Laurel. Thank you. Laurel, we have to take the chairs down? We have to take the chairs down. God bless you. Guys.